All right. Well, welcome everyone, the folks who came in person and the folks that we have online in Zoom world or YouTube world, as the case may be. Uh, my name is John Bateman. I'm a senior fellow here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in our Technology and International Affairs program. And I'm very delighted to have Max Smeets here to talk about his new book, uh, No Shortcuts, Why States Struggle to Develop a Military Cyber Force. Um, let me just say this is one of our first hybrid physical public events here. Um, so we're delighted to have people. Um, and uh, let me just give a quick introduction to Max. Uh, Max is someone who probably deserves a long elaborate introduction, but I'm gonna give him a short one because we really wanna hear from him today. Uh, Max is a senior researcher at the Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich and director of the European Cyber Conflict Research Initiative. Of course, we're here today to talk about his terrific new book, No Shortcuts, uh, but he's also the author of Deter, Disrupt, or Deceive, Assessing Cyber Conflict as an Intelligence Contest with Robert Chesney. And he's published quite widely on a wide range of issues related to cyber statecraft strategy and risk. Uh, Max was previously a postdoctoral fellow and lecturer at Stanford and a lecturer at Oxford, which is where he earned his doctorate. So before I turn it over to Max, let me just say a few brief words about uh, why we wanted to invite him here today and why everyone should read his excellent new book. Um, so ever since cyberspace has emerged as a factor in international relations and statecraft, there's been a real fascination that many of us have had with what we might call cyber strategy. Um, and I think people often equate cyber strategy with the use of cyber capabilities. Um, once you have a cyber capability, what should you do with it? And so then we get into the perennial issues of deterrence, compellence, international law, international norms. And these are important topics, but I think what makes Max's book really unique is he takes us one step farther back. And he says, well, before we have cyber strategy, we need to have cyber capacity. And Max makes the argument that there's a lot less of that than people might think, that actually still it's a small number of states that are doing the most significant operations, in particular what he calls military cyber effects operations, which we'll hear about. Um, so if you often hear the statistics about cyber proliferation, the number of states with cyber commands, well, Max is one of the few people who's actually peeled back the onion on those 40, 50, 60 cyber commands to actually inquire as to what's happening inside of them. And the answer that he gives is often not much. So we're gonna talk about that today. And I think that's quite relevant to the work that we do at Carnegie, thinking about cyber as a factor in international stability. And so one of the things that I think Max's book causes us to question is our assumptions about the degree to which cyberspace truly has been militarized. Um, and maybe it won't really be that much more militarized in the future than it is today. We'll talk about that. I'll just say that it's very timely to be having this discussion in the context of Russia's war in Ukraine, which has caused a widespread uh, reassessment of the role of cyberspace as a military domain and the value of cyber capabilities as military instruments. Um, and let me just say also, this is just a very well-written book. Uh, Max is an excellent writer. He synthesizes a huge range of materials from academic theory to Dutch military budget documents to the technical details uh, leaked by Edward Snowden. Um, and there's a plethora of insights in here that are in relevant to an informed audience, but I think probably anyone would find this book to be readable. So with that said, uh, Max, let me give it over to you to make some brief remarks, give us the gist of what your book is all about, and then we'll have a discussion. And I should just say that we're gonna be taking questions for the audience in the latter half of this talk. And so for folks online, please uh, type your questions into the chat. I'll be able to access those here. And for folks in the audience, please also be thinking about your questions for Max. So Max, please take it away. Thank you, John, for the kind introduction and a great summary. I think this uh, summarizes it better than I do myself. And I might hire you for a couple of other events that have coming up later this afternoon and tomorrow. Um, so I may not have to do it myself. Um, indeed, what's, let me put this a little bit lower so uh, you might hear me better. What, um, what this book starts off with is a dual observation. On the one hand, what we have seen is the uh, institutionalization of military cyber efforts. What do I mean with that is that countries have not only published a cyber strategy or a cyber defense strategy, but have now also established a often military cyber command with an explicit mandate to conduct 
defensive cyber operations, and in particular, cyber effect operations. Cyber effect operations are those operations where this aim to disrupt, deny, degrade, and or destroy. But whilst we have seen this development, at the same time, we've actually seen very few countries conducting cyber effect operations. So it's not that we have seen few cyber effect operations overall, but the ones that we know of are attributed to a relatively small number of countries. So there is a gap here, and this gap is growing. Now we can think of a number of different reasons as to what explains this gap between, on the one hand, the significant institutionalization, and on the other hand, this lack of activity from a wide range of countries. The first one is simply one about the information environment. Well, you know, it's hard to know, certainly for an analyst with only access to public information, about all the activity that is going on. And clearly, we're missing quite a few significant operational activities that can be attributed to states that we haven't previously attributed to. But at the same time, when we look at some of the public inquiries that are out there, for instance, in Denmark, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, we also know that some countries, unless people have lied in front of, of, of parliament, uh, which is not unique, um, you, um, you can say with quite high level of confidence that these countries haven't been engaged in um, cyber effect operations by the military. The second set of reasons is where the literature has really focused on, and also the policy community. That has been saying, well, yeah, sure, these cyber effect operations, um, you may establish a cyber command, but actually cyber effect operations are lousy tools for coercion. It's hard to signal them, and as a result of it, it's also hard to change the cost-benefit analysis of your adversaries, and hence countries haven't really been conducting these operations. Or an argument that can be made is said, well, sure, you focus on effect operations, but really, the space is one of an intelligence contest. And so it's primarily about espionage activity that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's not so much on the high-end activity. A, a, a related argument I've made myself with Richard Hognett, arguing, you know, well, it's a lot about activity below the threshold of armed attack that can cumulatively still be strategically meaningful. Or a third argument that you hear is, well, cross-domain deterrence works. We haven't seen these significant operations, because in that case, you can actually respond with means outside of the cyber domain, and as a result of that, uh, countries are deterred of doing so. But this book then indeed takes a step back and says, well, this is all based on one fundamental assumption, and that is that states can conduct these operations in the first place. And I contest that, as the title suggests, and explain that states struggle to develop a military cyber force. Now let me, I can discuss different elements on how I set up a capacity, a framework for capacity development of different militaries and how this changes over time, how states can collaborate and, and also use the private sector for the capability development. Instead of hitting all those points, let me just make two or three kind of basic ones to start off this conversation. The most basic one is around capability development and how we conceptualize it. We so often hear about cyber weapons being stockpiled or launched against other countries. But ultimately, what we're, of course, talking about are cyber operations are a set of activities for which you may or may not use certain tools to gain access, to escalate access, and ultimately achieve an effect on a target. And how I conceptualize capability development here is across five elements. People, exploits, tools, infrastructure, and organization. People of those five are clearly the most important. That's the most important element. And ultimately then, if we think about capability development, it's then about the training, retention, and recruitment of your talented individuals. That not only includes your operators, developers, system administrators, and so on, it also includes your legal uh, experts, strategists, and uh, the more less tech-oriented uh, uh, personnel. Now, the second point is, if that is the case, if capability development is primarily about the training, retention, and recruitment of people, then the strategic posture that countries have developed can greatly influence this capacity building element. More specifically, what we have seen actually of most countries that have established a military cyber command is a cyber command with a really narrow mandate. 
a mandate in which they are only allowed to operate in wartime. And only in wartime, they are often not even allowed to do reconnaissance. That's something still for the intelligence service. But only allowed to achieve an effect, uh, i.e. basically deliver a, a payload. In peacetime, the cyber commands are there just for training purposes and uh, to maybe deterrent purposes, but don't have an active day-to-day -day mission. And even in peacetime, they're not allowed to potentially um, yeah, do also reconnaissance activity to get an understanding of potential target networks that you may want to hit in the future. And what you can see in simple terms is then the open question, how do you then train and recruit and retain your talent? Um, unlike many of the intelligence services, there is much less of a day-to-day -day mission. And we've seen kind of three different solutions that you see coming up, particularly across continental Europe. One, the first one is focusing on reserves bringing in people from the private sector at a time when needed. The second is to focus heavily on military cyber exercises. Um, so you're going to um, try and train through exercises your, your workforce. And the third one is to focus on cyber mission forces, which integrate your intelligence with your military activities. I can discuss in the Q&A why each of the three um, face significant problems to actually minimize this gap and develop the work. Last point is around about organizational integration, um, because that's one that constantly comes up now, is clearly of all the solutions that exist, the one that stands out is a closer in organizational integration between your military services and your intelligence services, not just at the highest level of a potential dual-headed position uh, like you have here in the US um, for General Nakasone, both leading US Cyber Command and NSA, but at a lower operator level. And there are obvious benefits to doing that. On the one hand, it may help you to not just transfer explicit knowledge, that type of knowledge that can be clearly communicated, but also tacit knowledge, this knowledge that you can only get from basically sitting next to each other. It can promote specialization due to scale advantages. And you can potentially leverage previous activities that you've conducted by one organization or one entity and can then be used by another entity. But it also comes with really significant risks. And I thought to point out just one here. The most obvious one comes from the potential uh, link between your intelligence capabilities and your effect capabilities um, that often the military uses. One of the most famous cases that are out there is Stuxnet. Um, it's a case that has been so often mentioned, but I think it's worth mentioning here again. Uh, a case with a clear goal to achieve an effect against a nuclear centrifuge in a tons. And uh, despite its cunning way, it ultimately got discovered um, by a couple of private sector um, firms. Now, what is interesting here in relation to Stuxnet is that was a very cunning attack that took some time to develop. But what's more interesting is that it was linked to a whole range of espionage platforms, particularly Doku, Doku 2.0, to some other extent also Gauss, Flame, Mini Flame, all names for espionage activities that existed around the same time. What you see here is that due to the code overlap of Stuxnet with some of those other intelligence capabilities that are much less likely to get discovered, you get a bit of a domino effect. The discovery of Stuxnet also then leads to losses in other capabilities down the road as well. So whilst you may see some resource efficiency early on, actually down the line putting all your eggs in one basket may um, be uh, leading to some negative um, capacity degradation. I'll leave it there and I'm happy to take any questions on my book or indeed also on Ukraine, um, which is of course an event that took place um, when it was already uh, at the publisher. Great, well thank you Max for that terrific presentation. I'm gonna get the conversation started. I'll ask you a few questions, but. I'd love if folks online in the room started to think about their own questions for Max. Um, he'll answer any question. He promised me he would answer any question on any topic. So um, uh, the overall structure of the book, you talked about this, this PTO framework of people, exploits, tools, infrastructure, and organizations. But I think there's one other framework that it might help to introduce to the audience, which is the typology that you create of states, categorizing different states according to the level of resources that they have for a military cyber command and the level of constraint and the variety of different types of constraint. I thought you might say a word about that typology because 
uh, you draw the what to maybe uh, many to be the, the counterintuitive or surprising conclusion that most states are in what we might think of as the worst category, what you call paper tigers, which are states with low resources and high constraints. And you have a fascinating case study on the Dutch military. Um, maybe you could say a word about that because many of us have read many case studies about China, Iran, North Korea, the United States. We don't often see the case studies of the less capable military actors, which you argue is actually the majority of them. So um, I'd love to, if you could talk about that. Yeah, so the first observation I make is that this is clearly not a level playing field. And when we have these questions around, you know, what are the barriers of entry? The barriers of entry to cyberspace are low. Well, perhaps to some actors more than others. And the key point here is that achieving a specific effect at a specific point in time, ensuring that you can minimize undesired damage, uh, deconfliction with your intelligence, and so on, that's actually often pretty hard to do. But conducting an, uh, achieving a, an effect on a target where you don't get too much of causing collateral damage, don't get too much on when you're going to hit this target, don't get too much on how does this link with other operational activity, that's a lot easier to do. Now, when we think about the majority of states that have established a cyber command, they primarily want to do the former type of operations. They are quite constrained, and I discussed this on the strategic, organizational, and, uh, and the legal uh, aspects thereof. And so you can almost create this two by two, which I do as a, as a political scientist uh, of these highly constrained states and uh, that are also um, high on resources or these low constrained states that are uh, high on resources and the fourth. So to draw this out a bit further, a country that is uh, relatively low in constraints and high resources, uh, an obvious case would be Russia. A case of low resources, high, uh, low constraints, was early North Korean activity. If you think about the high constraint, um, high resources, that's clearly the US pre-2018. Uh, but when you then think about the box of indeed low or high constraints, low resources, that's I think where the majority of particularly uh, continental European countries fall into. And I'd provide the case of the Netherlands, partially because of an information advantage having um, um, had many discussions uh, with some of the people involved in the establishment of the command and so on for the last decade, but also because it's a really intriguing case more generally. We know generally the Netherlands is a highly competent cyber power. Someone like in the Harvard Cyber Power Index is ranked, what, second, third, I don't know. Uh, we know of lots of really interesting intelligence cases where the Dutch uh, intelligence services helped um, uh, the U.S. understand the DNC hack by being directly into the systems of, of not just cozy bear but also fancy bear. And there's some really fascinating discoveries that have been done also in the later years, um, such as around the OPCW hack in The Hague. Um, so it's kind of perceived as this incredible power. But at the same time, when we actually look at what the military is able to do, it suffers from some significant problems. And one that I already mentioned is this mandate issue, where also the Dutch Cyber Command is only mandated to conduct operations in times of war, and even in times of war, it cannot do much of this preparatory activity that um, is in the hands of the intelligence agencies. Um, to contextualize that case, it's, it, it is also part of a broader trend as to when this militarization came up. It came up after you know, the financial crisis, countries start to think of this, at a time of significant austerity, significant defense budget cuts. In the case of the Netherlands, they were almost selling everything. All of their Leopard tanks were gone. The only two projects that they actually kept was one high capital intensive one, which was the Joint Strike Fighter, and the second one was the establishment of the Dutch Cyber Command. So it came at a time where particularly the army lost you can say oh, almost all of its, its, its forces. And so it's no coincidence that the cyber command was then initially established also within the army branch, not necessarily once seen before as for its technical savviness within the Netherlands. And as it was established there, just to highlight one additional element, what you see is you saw these budget cuts, people being laid off. So they said, well, we're only going to recruit a technical talent from within our, um, our Ministry of Defense. So you've got, you're pulling the, 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 the technical talent together in this one organization, that's the goal. 
But then, as you're doing this, and it, uh, you're, you're providing a, a, a relatively short training program in the Dutch case, uh, i.e. Uh, a couple of weeks uh, of initial training, then followed by a few months of training, and an internship in a private sector company. But what it leads to then is, sure, these people are then sort of trained up. They're not entirely sure what they're going to do. And then creating a perfect recruitment platform for private sector companies to come in and say, well, if we've now all pulled this really interesting talent into one organization. They've done these internships at the private sector, and you're losing many of them. And uh, certainly in two years' time, but also often already within a year. And so you then get this problem of training, but above all of retention. It's how are you going to keep those people? Um, and so it's kind of like a, an interesting illustrative case of some of the problems and dynamics that you're seeing with many of these organizations where, again, initially, I'm not saying you shouldn't have any private sector cooperation here. Obviously, there is a real need at, at times to do that, but also the struggles that you're facing and the way in which then recruitment takes place in these organizations with a limited mandate. I, if memory serves, you, you quote a uh, former leader, a recent leader of the Dutch military cyber organization, and that person says that the net result of this is that they've never actually conducted a cyber effects operation. Is that right? That's correct. Yes, yeah, she, uh, the the commander mentioned this in a newspaper uh, for the NRC. Um, she, in that interview that I quote in the book, said never independently. Mm -hmm. um, there is a second quote which actually is not in the book um, that she mentioned in an interview with a officer writing a master thesis for uh, is it the Naval War College in Monterey where she kind of confirmed that this was not just never independently, but also never uh, as an organization what have received the mandate to, to do so. Yeah. Well, Max, you do a great job in the book of scouring so many non-traditional resources like that master's thesis <laughs> yeah. interview. As a former intelligence officer, I very much respect your open source savvy. I think another thing that you alluded to in your description just now is you try to actually historicize the development of these capabilities in particular moment in time. You mentioned the financial crisis. I think a lot of cyber strategists imagine that there's just this inevitable future gravity pulling us into more and more cyber capabilities. But you point out it actually does matter when those capabilities are stood up and what kind of resources are available. And I wanted to ask you about that because some people might be listening to this and they would say, OK, but Max, cyber is cheap. You know, you could do this stuff so cheaply. Um, and yet, you quote some very notable statistics in the book about some very big ticket items, um, like, for example, the development of certain kind of infrastructure that a, company, uh, a country like U.S. Cyber, uh, Cyber Command might develop. Maybe you could tell some folks about some of the actual costs that go into developing an elite cyber capability. Yeah, that's a really great observation. Uh that you make there also around infrastructure. So when we go back to this framework, so I developed this framework called PATIO, People, Exploits, Tools, Infrastructure, and Organization. By and large, the existing community has focused on one of those five elements, which is the exploit side of things. Um, and there are different types of exploits. The most prominent one are your ODAs, those unknown, um, which treat, seek to exploit an unknown vulnerability that is not yet known to the vendor or wider public. You also then have the more wider known uh, end day uh, or uh, um, exploits as well. And uh, we've gotten, we've seen a wide range of books discussing the trade and exploits as well and the millions that uh, governments are potentially spending on this. Uh, some, some New York Times reporting on this whole industry of exploits and, and, and sales thereof. Yet, when we think about this, there are two observations. First of all, the more advanced operations, it's ultimately about understanding the target network of your adversary better than they do themselves, as Rob Joyce would, uh, would say as well, former head of NSA's Taylor Access Operations Unit. And often when you understand the network of your adversary better than they do themselves, you don't need a fancy exploit to get in. You don't need something exotic. There are way more conventional means to get in. And then when you get discovered, it's also often way more difficult to attribute. So that's the first one. We have exaggerated the importance of, of particularly zero days in operational usage. But in the second, we've under 
estimated, and, and still countries today are kind of grappling with this, the costs of infrastructure development. And in the book, I make a distinction between two, two different types of infrastructure. The first one is the type of infrastructure, the control infrastructure you use for a given operation and you then almost throw away. The second is this preparatory infrastructure that um, is highly costly and you will use for many years to come. That includes, in simple terms, two different types of, of infrastructure broadly defined. The first one are your ranges to test and retest your capabilities and to train your workforce. And the second is primarily in the databases for targeting in the future. On the former, as you say, we have seen indeed some significant numbers where the exploit space, we're talking in the millions, we needed the US Army has set out a procurement two years ago for a $2 billion cyber range. Uh, the numbers there are very, very different. And it's also in many ways needed for particularly the more responsible constrained actors and indeed to make sure that your workforce trains in the right way. And so, and that opens with that awareness a whole range of other questions around the transfer of capabilities, the role of the private sector, where they can make the most money really in you know, collaborating with some cyber commands and also to what degree states can potentially collaborate. Where we have been talking about, you know, does a country share its exploits or tools with another country? The real question is to what degree can you share some of your training facilities with other countries as well to develop this workforce that may not always have this day-to-day -day mission? Two billion dollars for a cyber range. I mean, that's an extraordinary sum, far more, you know, I think your figures show that the Dutch military has maybe on, only spent perhaps less than $100 million ever on these capabilities, mm -hmm. something to something that, that effect. When I was in the office of the Secretary of Defense, we worried a lot about something called the unified platform, um, which is really just a system for integrating a variety of different pieces of information. Um, that hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on that. And, and I remember just sometimes just scratching my head and thinking, is Russia spending hundreds of millions of dollars on a unified platform? Because they seem to be able to get a lot done. Um, so maybe that would be a good transition, and I want to turn to the audience after this, but just to tee up um, some, some country-level discussion here. Um, Russia is perpetrating an, exec, uh, an, an aggressive war in Ukraine, of which its cyber capabilities are one component of that military conflict. Um, and many people have been struck by uh, what they believe to be um, an underperformance of Russia. I wonder if, uh, and I know you said your book was written prior to the conflict's outbreak, but the frameworks that you have, um, uh, like the PTO framework, is that something that can help us understand what we're seeing in Ukraine today as far as the battlefield utility, the ultimate test of a military cyber command or some military cyber commands is how can they contribute to um, a larger war effort? And, and what are we seeing there with reference to the framework in your book? Yeah, it's a good question, um, and indeed much has been written uh, on um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine already and uh, its seeming underperformance of, uh, in, in the cyber realm or more generally. Um, and many, which I don't need to repeat here, have given different reasons for that as well. So let's not indeed go into that right here and let me focus on your question. So first one observation. In the book, I describe the known effect operations that Russia has conducted in the past. And some of them have been, first of all, the majority of them, or almost majority of known effect operations in the past, pre-invasion, were against Ukraine. People tend to forget that. Of a couple stand out, uh, not least the two against the uh, Ukrainian power grid with uh, some significant destructive and disruptive consequences, also attempted attacks, for instance, against the chlorine station that luckily enough didn't really take place. If it would have taken place, who knows what the consequences would have been. But what we see in the invasion is in some ways a different type of modus operandi, where we saw these, particularly the second attack, for instance, of Russia against the Ukrainian power grid, these highly we can say modular capabilities and flexible capabilities that could potentially be used in other cases as well. They were quite big pieces of malware. And hence, you got questions here in the US about this being you know, a test bed 
for maybe future activity that can also be used then against um, maybe um, US uh, critical infrastructure as well. What we see in Ukraine is a very different setup. The operational tempo has clearly increased with the invasion. And with that, we have seen Russia primarily focus on the use of what we call wipers, data destruction malware, and using a wide range of variations there. But they are really much smaller and much more focused on doing basically one thing. So you don't have these highly flexible modular malware platforms, but just very simple malware uh, with just one goal, and that's data destruction. And as a result of that, we have seen a number of variants now, and I actually have lost count whether we're now at number 10 or 11, and we have seen also a couple of times uh, reuse. Um, the number of variants just in these, what are we now in, eight months, um, is more than the number of variants that we've ever discovered before. Um, so it's like that operational tempo is fascinating. And that also then indeed leads to questions on how are you going to set up in wartime a capacity that indeed differs from peace. And this question on, um, you can say, your ability to, on the one hand, so on the people side, like I'm just thinking this through on the people side, you've got questions on, OK, if you're engaged in a certain conflict, how much of your resources are being put into that, and how much can you still do parallel operations? It's hard to know in the Russian case to what degree they can now do also, for instance, parallel operations in countries like Poland or others. Mm -hmm. Some have said, yes, they can. We've also lost visibility due to uh, previous reporting on Russia and them retooling. Um, so there's a big question there on, on, on tasking. But above all, what you see on the export tools and infrastructure side is that you tend to focus even more on uncustomized or super sophisticated high-end um, capabilities and go for things that you can quickly deploy and burn after. So you're changing the way in which you're actually um, deploying and redeploying some of your capabilities there. Thanks, Max. I think there's a lot more that we could dig in on the Russia-Ukraine war and lots of other country case studies. But I want to go to the audience now, see if I can get any hands up, folks in the room who have any questions. Yes, please. Congratulations on the book. Um, I have just two questions. The first one, I would love to hear your thoughts on the application of the rules of law to cyberspace. Specifically, uh, specifically if, if in your opinion there's the need to draft new international binding rules for cyberspace. Second question, uh, Costa Rica. If what is happening in Costa Rica right now uh, can be a game changer in terms not only of cooperation uh, in cyberspace, but also uh, I'm thinking of this increasing development of cyber capabilities in, in the less developed countries. Thank you. Sure. So on the first one, no, we don't necessarily need new rules, but we need to be clear on how international law applies. And on the international level, we have luckily come again to an agreement that uh, international law applies, at least in the UN, GGG, and Open Ended Working Group. Uh, but the question is, how does it apply? And uh, there are obvious differences between, uh, you can say, NATO countries uh, or the more like-minded countries and, for instance, Russia or China. Um, there are also internal differences. And I think that's something where we can work on to really tease out in the future, and that can be consequential. To mention one here, you see a difference in stance between, for instance, the UK and France or Germany um, where, or the Netherlands, where the UK has this view that sovereignty as a principle doesn't apply in cyberspace, whereas the other countries say it does. Now, it very much changes as a result of that on what you see as legitimate behavior um, and how you can call out uh, operational activity of some of your adversaries. Sovereignty doesn't apply. Of course, for yourself, it gives you way more freedom of maneuver. You can suddenly maybe even probe into allied networks and say, well, you know, but sovereignty here is not, uh, doesn't apply in the same way as in, in, in conventional space. So there is, a, there is not just a question here on like, oh, how do like-minded versus not like-minded distinctions made? How do they differ? And how do we address this? But actually, within particularly NATO countries, there are real questions here that need to be addressed and um, haven't been done so sufficiently. 
Your second one is around Costa Rica. So for those uh, who are unfamiliar with the case, uh, to provide some context, um, there was a major uh, attack against Costa Rica done by a group calling themselves, or has been given the name Conti. Um, and Conti is a ransomware group operating from Russia that pledged allegiance to the Russian government at the time of the invasion. Um, that said, they were already highly significant in uh, the years before being seen as the ransomware group that was most profitable. Uh, now, so it's part of a broader trend on the use of, of the criminal organizations that are conducting ransomware operations and doing this in ways that um, are significant because they explicitly state in the case of Conti, we only go after major targets. This is from a profit perspective. We're not gonna target the small you know, uh, pastry shop down the road here where we can maybe get a couple of hundred K at most. No, we're going after these big, often corporate networks or maybe healthcare systems or something else that when you have it, you know, uh, hold it uh, and decrypt the data, uh, sorry, encrypt the data and not decrypt it until they, uh, they pay, you can really ask for way more significant sums of money. In this specific case, just to provide more context, what we saw as um, Conti pledged allegiance to the Ukrainian, uh, to the Russian government, is that there were the Conti leaks. And the Conti leaks is that there was someone in the organization that leaked at least some of their messaging communication um, that provides a unique case study of how this criminal group actually operates, the type of extortions, the way in which they try to recruit people, and even how they think about themselves being named the Conti group and questioning whether they don't want to give a different name to themselves. Now, Costa Rica is significant not only because it is the, like a country saying and calling out an emergency status and saying, you know, this is a national security threat, but it is also interesting in it being almost Conti's last act. So Conti no longer seems to exist. It will certainly regroup. But this was kind of like a clear attack that not necessarily had a just profit motive, but also a motive attached to it of, I think they made statements, well, there should be regime change. There should be lots of these kind of things that lead to, um, that, that clearly are not there for profit reasons. What's significant is that you will see this kind of phoenix arising from the ashes inevitably, where in a year from now you will see a regrouping of Conti in one way or another, and the structural aspects here of this space haven't changed at all. Conti may no longer exist, but ransomware is still profitable. There are still very relatively easy ways to make sure you can monetize the money you earned from ransomware through uh, Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency. We still see lots of government systems being unsecure. We can expect, indeed, this to be uh, not the last case uh, that may happen in the future, and one where criminal organizations play an ever more important role also in the international domain. Great, well, I saw another question here. I do wanna to go to a question from the chat, if that's all right, and then I'll come back to you, sir. Um, so one of the questions that a virtual audience member has asked is, what are your predictions of cyber operations during wartime in less advanced economies or in countries in the global south? Um, and as you're, as you're thinking about that, Max, you know, one thing that comes to mind for me is that a lot of the wars that we actually see in the world, including in less advanced economies and in the global south, are civil wars. Uh, we have uh, seen a significant civil war in, in, in inner conflict in, in Ethiopia, for example. Um, so for a country like that, what what do you predict as far as the, the resources that they would have available? And then also, would that change the kind of restraints or constraints that they'd be under? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. Not least because um, I've been thinking a little bit about this in, in recent months uh, because of a, a UN effort that starts to think about um, ceasefire agreements and uh, whether there should be a cyber clause in there as well. Mm. And so at the moment it isn't, but there is an increasing recognition that some of these civil conflicts that happen, um, there could be some type of, you can say, cyber element that is sufficiently relevant to be included there. And that then first requires an understanding of what are then these elements that we can look at. Um, my current thinking is, well, actually, 
perhaps less of a worry of these super significant disruptive cyber effect operations that would take place at that time. But two things that stand out is one is the relatively easy use of surveillance capabilities at that time. To what degree would then one militant leader, you know, spy on a militant leader of another uh, of, of another um, grouping, and what are the consequences thereof, and uh, and those kind of questions. And the second one is one of um, uh, around data control, and particularly if you would have more centralized for instance, cloud-based um, data structures that are based in one territory and not another, once that is controlled by one actor, what are they allowed or not allowed to do, do, do with that and how do you control that? So this becomes a kind of a similar research que resource question that exists with other high-value resources in times of conflict and control thereof, of which multiple parties are dependent. Um, I can't give perfect answers here, and, but it is a question, and I really like it, that is only now kind of being addressed and hopefully with a couple of workshops that are being organized in the coming months, uh, some of these aspects will be teased out further. Great, thank you. Uh, gentleman over here, uh, we've got a behind you. Well, um, congratulations on, on both of your wonderful, fascinating discussion. Really looking forward to, to reading the, um, the book. My questions are a little bit off the book, if I may. Um, NATO and Russia. What do you think would be the, the threshold for triggering Article 5? Hmm. And a more of a conceptual question, uh, which kind of ends up with what you were saying about peace deals, incorporating or not cyber elements. We can have a formal peace and cyber war at the same time. So my question is, does it make sense to speak about cyber war and its opposite, cyber peace? Are we in, in, in such a condition today to, to speak about this in such terms? Thank you so much. On um, the first one, let's first take a step back and discuss what NATO has done in this space. So um, from 2012, questions arise within NATO on how should we do, deal with this issue of cyberspace as a maybe domain of warfare, which countries have already acknowledged that way, should we start doing this as well? And it took a few years to then ultimately say, uh, well, you know, Article 5 can be triggered in case of a cyber attack. That was the first kind of big statement. The focus there was very much on the high-end cyber activity, this potentially major operation attack that disrupts society and uh, you know, could potentially trigger Article 5, and as a result of that, provide a whole range of other responses. NATO, um, two years ago, partially based on the recognition coming out of the US, slightly changed this position, where it said, also now activity um, more minor cyber operational activity can cumulatively still trigger Article 5 because it can cumulatively still be strategically meaningful. So that has changed the seeming possibilities and opportunities in which Article 5 can be triggered. It's not only about this one single high-end cyber Pearl Harbor-like event that can trigger it, but also um, perhaps year-long disruptive activity mixed with hack and leak operation, disinformation, that they plausibly could argue this is a campaign of such a significance, it can trigger Article 5. That's a theory. If you would ask me, in practice, when do you expect it to occur? I still think in the first case, to rally around it. Now, I find it hard to believe that even if, whether this is, uh, I don't know, Iranian or Chinese or Russian activity, below the threshold is being ramped up in frequency and in diversity, more wipers or more events like, I don't know, a knot patcher that hits even more government networks and corporate networks, that it ultimately would trigger Article 5. I don't believe it. It has to be almost like this more single unitary event against the country or multiple with significant loss of death. But that's purely my kind of more feeling and expectation of when you get sufficient also political capital to actually make this case. Um, on your, your second question, um, would you mind repeating it? Sorry. So, uh, about more of a conceptual question, does it make sense to ah, yeah. think about cyber war and or cyber peace? So, um, there are lots of terms that are currently being used. Um, Lucas Keller talks about unpeace. It's not war, it's not peace. Um, 
we can talk about conflict as a kind of like, oh, you know, it's, it's not peace, cyber conflict, it's also not war, it's kind of something actually also in between. There are multiple out there. Sometimes the trickiness comes with the introduction of some of these new concepts. It is they sound terrific, but it then almost becomes hard to know what's excluded in there. So in the case of, if we have supposedly three categories, you have peace, unpeace, and war, what is then not in unpeace? It seems all cyber activity, um, I find it hard to, to use this, these, some of these concepts conceptually. Um, that said, yeah, I, I totally buy your argument that it's not as the economist, and um, we also will never see a true cyber war, but we will see a uh, cyber war, right? We see a war or an invasion where cyber elements may uh, play an ever increasingly important role, but never a cyber war on its own without conventional elements. And I think that's the most important one to, to bear in mind here. So I'm going to go to the chat again. Uh, Max, there's a question in the chat from an online audience member about encryption. They wanted to know what role strong encryption can play in cyber warfare as you see it. And maybe I can broaden that a little bit because. What you describe in the book, if, if I may characterize it, is that there has been a stubborn slowness of states around the world developing military cyber effects capabilities. And my takeaway from your book is that's not likely to change anytime soon. So I guess maybe one question would be, are there technological dimensions of this that we could anticipate could either accelerate the development of state capabilities or continue to make those capabilities uh, slow to develop, whether it's encryption, artificial intelligence, some other kind of technological um, intervention or trajectory that could change what you see. Yeah, so what I do in the book is I provide this framework, and then the next chapter I say, this is a static framework, this PTO framework. It can change over time. And there I rely much more on the economics literature. It talks about experience curve effects, how experience can change um, the ability to effectively develop a certain um, product or service. Normally there are three key elements that uh, can make uh, an organization more efficient. The first one is perhaps the most basic one, that's learning. If you're doing something repeatedly, you will get better at it. And we've seen this particularly with, in the cyber domain with very likely Iranian activity. Uh, following Shamoon, we've seen a couple of, Shamoon was an operation against Saudi Aramco, we've seen a, a, a couple of other operations from Iran, Shamoon 2.0, Stone Drill, other fancy names given for um, uh, also wiper operations that didn't make exactly the same mistakes. They still were not super sophisticated, but didn't make some of the obvious mistakes they were making before. So one is learning, and, 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 and I think to a degree, you will see some learning taking place. Um, but then for that, countries will have to actually start doing stuff in a way. So clearly, learning is something you will certainly see in US Cyber Command and you know, with the new National Cyber Force in the UK, but not for all countries. And in fact, some of those countries may suffer from unlearning as well, mm. where you've got people who were there, had a certain skills, and then leave. So learning is there, but unlearning is just as, you can expect that just as much as, um, as, uh, um, as well. The second element um, that can enhance efficiency is scale, right? And as we see organizations grow, and the US is a good example of that, having ever more cyber mission forces now being officially at fully operational capacity of 133 mission forces, you can increase uh, opportunities on an organization level for specialization uh, and those kind of elements that help you being more efficient. There are also opportunities for scale on the infrastructure side of things, almost, although a bit, um, almost like a Netflix model. Once you've created you know, uh, a platform, it doesn't matter how many users there are on there, it's a little bit the same, not completely, but a little bit with the cyber ranges too. So there are opportunities there for scale benefits. Um, but then the third one is technology that influences efficiency, and technology, we have seen great advancements being uh, made in the past of very simple tools that can be super effective uh, for scanning networks or um, making sure that you effectively, that you use your, your capabilities, particularly uh, your exploits and tools in the most effective way, all of those things. 
Um, but then the obvious question as you raised is one around AI, right? Okay, how does AI transform this in the future? I, at the moment, I come down as like, you know, it's clearly a double-edged sword. Um, and it's an easy argument to make to not take a position on one or the other and say, you know, it will completely transform or not. But you can see the benefits coming on both sides and particularly around vulnerability discovery where, um, you know, vulnerability discovery in the east thereof through AI applications can really help on both the defensive side, but it can also have obvious offensive applications and some of that we have already seen in, in exercises. One last point more out of fascination, like I think yesterday or the day before I became aware of a paper that I thought was fascinating that was using language models to basically in, in, in vulnerable code to, uh, when, once you basically flag it as vulnerable code, to automatically rewrite it in, in, in a way that is seemingly uh, fixes the flaw. And I was like, wow, that is like an incredible application where you see like really real creativity that I haven't heard of before. And perhaps some of those kind of cases that we see today that can sway the balance on either on the offensive or defensive side that I am currently unaware of, I'm sure there are more examples, um, are clearly worthy to, to keep in mind. I can't think of, you know, there have been a couple of good pa papers that have been published in this space, but I think there's certainly more to be done there to kind of survey the field as to what's out there. Great. Any other more questions in the room? If not, I'll go online. Oh, oh yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, Mike. Thank you. Should work in. Yeah. Um, and thank you for coming to DC. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, from my own experience in my own country, Cyber Command mm, in peacetime not only focuses on training, but could also be, for example, used for um, other projects and other agendas, such as strategic communication. Um, so is this something that you also observed during your research in other countries that Cyber Commands and what they do would actually sometimes delineate from the original mandate and actually be used for um, their where you actually need it maybe the most at, at some time, at some point. And then the second question, I think it was published two weeks ago or some, some weeks ago, uh, that the EU con, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was conducting a cyber offensive operation uh, in Croatia, um, uh, like a joint US-Croatia uh, cyber operation. So uh, I would just like to like know your opinion on the evolution of publicly shared uh, joint cyber offensive operation that the US conducts partners and allies, like what trends uh, have you observed there, and um, is there anything that you think you So on the first one, yeah, this is indeed a very interesting and good point you're making, right? As organizations are developing, seeing their mission and role, they are then looking for indeed new opportunities of relevance that weren't initially baked into the organizational design and footprint. Um, you see this more sticking to a focus on, yeah, actually communication is, is an important one, seeing themselves almost as a signaling function to the outside world to showcase more broader technical sophistication of a country that hopefully helps to establish a deterrence posture. You also see this in, although there is significant pushback more on the defensive side, where particularly in, 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 uh, in Europe, uh, whilst maybe militaries want to pivot in that direction, they quickly get pushed back from civilian organizations saying like, hey, this is not your realm at all. So whilst they have attempted, they, um, they rarely actually go in that direction. And things you've seen in the US with US Cyber Command disrupting um, botnets like TrickBot, uh, it's, it's not something I expect to see in, this, uh, in the future in many other countries. Uh, where this will then be something that the police will do or the intelligence services will uh, will do. On your second one, so um, I'm actually unaware of the Croatian case, um, but uh, I assume you're referring to, and tell me if I'm wrong here, a broader trend of uh, the US now doing hunt forward operations in countries such as Croatia, but there are many, many other examples. I believe 
the number is now on 13 uh, partner countries, um, where um, the US um, actively hunts in those networks together with some of its allies to find uh, malware and then potentially disclose this or use this for other disruptive purposes. This fits in a broader strategy for those who are less aware of it of the US uh, since 2018 around persistent engagement and defend forward where the US is more actively not just deterring adversarial activity but also disrupting adversarial activity and quote unquote doing this globally continuously and seamlessly. That is, um, has led to um, um, some concerns about whether the US will maybe do this too much on their own and to what degree that can cause diplomatic friction. Um, but this is then an initiative where it is done with partners. And I think that's a very positive development, perhaps especially for the lesser, um, the less mature uh, states that don't have their own attributive capabilities. I think that's a very, uh, think it's a worthy thing to do. Um, at the same time, we should be, in this context, be aware of the limits of this cooperation, right? So this is ultimately, most of the time, these are a couple of US operators coming in, sitting in the same room, opening their laptop, not always even having coffee or lunches with the people that are in that same um, organization, and kind of after a few weeks, leave and have rarely chatted to each other. Um, that is, you know, like that sometimes seems to be the nature of it. Um, and so that, that's one. And the second is, well, sure, that defensive activity takes place and it's mutually beneficial. It also gives US great visibility. But there's still open questions on how you cooperate on actually offensive activity. And this is what we've also seen in the Ukraine context, where we saw an interview from General Nakisoni with Sky News with Alexander Martin, where Everyone jumped on the fact that uh, General Nakasone also confirmed initial hunt forward operations in Ukrainian networks with people leaving the day of the invasion or a couple of days before. But also in that interview, um, Nakasone men mentions um, that the US has conducted full spectrum operations and defensive and offensive operations. What is meant with full spectrum? The reporter never further asked any more questions, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, but that seems to suggest that there is quite a wide scale of activity that the US has done. And, but that wasn't part of some partnership. And that's an interesting one. Like I really don't know how much they then share with the Ukrainians on what they would and would not disrupt, who had the decisions there to be made. Could the U Ukrainians veto that or not? Or did they have to kind of let the US in and do that? Lots of really interesting open questions here with another party mingling in a potential, you know, or in, in, a, in a conflict that haven't really been addressed. Um, but it requires an initial awareness and understanding of what these terms and operations actually entail and what the differences are. And I feel they have not always been too clearly distinguished and spelled out in, in, the, in the relevant policy communities. Well, thanks, Max. Unfortunately, we're running very short on time. We pretty much have to wrap. Um, I have so many other questions, and there's more questions in the chat. This has been a fantastic discussion. I was just going to make one final remark and then pass the mic back over to you, Max, to see if there's anything that you want to just give us concluding thoughts on. Um, your, your focus in this book is military cyber effects operations. And I think that's what a lot of members of the general public and national leaders think of as kind of the, the key event in cyberspace, the key threat, the key way that force could be communicated. But at the same time, as we've discussed today, there's a lot of other things happening in cyberspace too. There's IP theft, spyware, uh, cyber-enabled information operations, ransomware. A lot of these things that we've talked about also are other important parts of cyberspace as an international security arena. Uh, so I hope that in your future work, you can continue to help elucidate all of these other facets of cyberspace. Um, uh, and if you do, I'm sure it'll be just as excellent as this book. If you could just offer any final comments before we close. No, and, and I hope that the Carnegie team can do that as well, you guys. You know, I'm alone sitting behind my desk. You have a big team here that has already done so much incredible work. I hope you can continue to do that, and then uh, I can learn from all the reports you're writing. So I'm happy to conclude with that and, um, and maybe discuss any other questions.
Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you, Max, for having and me. thank you, everyone.